for, for political science and law. And, and he is a, uh, also a member of the Philosophy and Liberation Research Group at the uh, UNMSM in Lima, the uh, University um, Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos. Um, he's, um, he's also a professor at the University um, uh, of, um, of UNED in Barcelona. Uh, and um, he's the author, among other, uh, besides many other articles and essays, of the book, uh, of a book called Decolonizzare la cultura, um, uh, razza, sapere e potere, uh, which in English, it, it is not uh, still, it is not tr translated to English, but it's translated uh, to, Fran uh, to French, uh, Decolonizing Culture, Race, Knowledge, and Power. And, um, uh, his, um, his, his work um, is, of course, uh, is, is mainly focused on, on the complicated bond which connects the Western philosophical tradition with the post-colonial and decolonial uh, thought. So um, uh, I think that this, uh, um, uh, that uh, this, uh, uh, this will be, this presentation will be, will revolve around a kind of a introduction uh, of the to the to the background um, uh, to the cultural background that uh, that have um, that have led to uh, uh, to celebrating today, unfortunately, uh, in many countries, what was in truth a uh, a genocide. Uh, I am I'm going to uh, shut up now <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, let uh, Leonardo start his presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Many thanks, Gabriel, and many thanks, Berenia. First of all, I want to deeply thank you, the Center for Advanced Studies of Southeastern Europe, for this kind invitation. I'm actually so glad to be here today. So let's start with the title of my conference, Escaping the Mythological Machine of Western Historiographical Distortion. The paradigmatic case of the National Day of Spain, in Spanish, no? Fiesta Nacional de España, and the meaning of celebrating uh, genocide. Um, in 1951, Hannah Arendt, published her first major work. I'm referring to the origins of totalitarianism, where the Jewish philosopher tried to equalize Nazism and Stalinism. Simultaneously, by a sufficiently accurate historical analysis, she showed that anti-Semitism was as old as Christian Europe. Therefore, she demonstrated that the collective cultural instance known as anti-Semitism with uh, its uh, dramatical secular consequences had a fundamental role in defining European identity, what I mean, religious, social, anthropological, epistemic, ethnic, and linguistic. Across the long historical process and inside the European territories. In fact, if we trace back the works, for instance, of the most important and brilliant Christian thinkers to the letters of Paul the Apostle, we can discover some crucial elaboration that have inspired racist theories and obviously political practices such as pogroms from the Middle Age to the beginning of the modern era. During the 16th century, 
while Europe was already involved in the world colonization process, the reception and improvement of that inherited theoretical and practical structures was a fundamental instrument. Um, first and uh, foremost, uh, there were the Spanish theologians, among whom I wish to mention just two, maybe the most important ones. I mean, Francisco Suarez and Francisco de Vitoria. Um, both of them, as heirs of the Reconquista, and by the way, this term, Reconquista, this concept emerged in Western historiography in the 19th century becoming soon a fundamental component of Spanish nationalism that was sadly survived to now. So the Reconquista, the period during which Jewish and Muslims were forcibly expelled from the Iberian Peninsula witnessed the abundant proliferation and circulation of the limpieza de sangre statutes. In English, limpieza de sangre literally means mm, cleanliness of blood, although its deep meaning, I think, is blood purity. And the first statutes was published in 1449 in Toledo, in Spain. So it was precisely within this cultural context that a renewed European tough could find a way to open itself toward the Atlantic roads. The consequences were profound. The legitimation of the conquest, the blessing of the African people slave trade you know, that began in the mid uh, 15th century, uh, the starting point of the African diaspora. By the way, Christopher Columbus, literally bearer of Christ, the mythical conquistador, not the mythical conqueror, who was a slave merchant working under the king of Portugal. And obviously the justification of the programmatic extermination of the native people of Abiyala. This name, Abiyala, is the original name of the part of our planet that European rebaptized South America during the age of enlightenment and that native people still use huh, as a such of linguistic resistance huh, against colonialism. In other words, in my opinion, we should begin to understand that European modern philosophies, as well as the political structure they inspired, are simply unthinkable without taking into account the deep, complex, and uh, almost completely dissimulated power relations ingrained in the colonial logic. So, Hannah Arendt, and the origins of totalitarianism. We are, I repeat, in 1951. The Second World War, another European war that brought terror worldwide, had ended six years before. In uh, 1950, in Martinique, 
uh, an island located in the Eastern Caribbean Sea, which is still today an integral part of French Republic and functions as an overseas department and single territorial collectivity of France. A black philosopher, poet, and politician, Aimé Césaire, broke the silence on colonialism, delivering a heavy blow to the received approach to the matter. A brief but revolutionary essay titled Discourse on Colonialism. But how was it possible? Because Césaire managed to displace the Eurocentric perspective by occupied a different position, a decolonial position that enabled him to bring to the world an alternative and unofficial version of history. Now built and spoken by the saddest voice of the colonized and mythicized subjects who now dared to resist. Precisely those human beings who had been historically regarded as passive and inert agents of history. The people who were not able to make history, but were subjected to it and entered it. Um, what Césaire wanted to do was to depict Europe as a never ending collective, dehumanized subject with destructive cultural features implemented since the so called year zero of modernity. You know, I'm talking about the 1492, would necessarily lead to the Nazi extermination camps. That's why he wrote, that's why Césaire wrote, and now I'm going to read a severe and significant passage taken from his book. Yes, it will be worthwhile to study clinically in detail the steps taken by Hitler and Hitlerism and to reveal to the very distinguished, very humanistic, very Christian bourgeois of the 20th century that without his being aware of it, he has a Hitler inside him, that Hitler inhabits him, that Hitler is the demon, that if he, he rails against him, he is being inconsistent, and that, at bottom, what he cannot forgive Hitler for is not the crime in itself, the crime against man. It is not the humiliation of man as such. It is the crime against the white man the humiliation of the white man and the fact that he applied to Europe colonialist procedures, which until then had been reserved exclusively for the Arabs of Algeria, the coolies of India and the niggers of Africa. So this secular hidden and inherited cultivation of racist and genocidal acts was precisely the polemic topic of the Martinican thinker who had some lines below. I'm going to read. No one colonized innocently, that no one colonized with impunity either, that a nation which colonizes that a civilization which justifies colonization and therefore force 
is already a sick civilization, a civilization which is morally deceased, which irresistibly progressing from one consequence to another, one denial to another, calls for its Hitler. So, two decisive terms used by Césaire were culture and colony. Uh, in my opinion, it's interesting to underline that both derive from the Latin verb colere, uh, literally to cultivate, working on the universe, but in a larger sense, they also mean taking care to honor or to venerate. Mm? So in this sense, the word culture refers to the act of cult itself, which has a saving and propitiatory purpose. Since it's sacralized through ritual practice. For example, if we analyze the circular passing of the seasons in the ancient pagan societies, it's possible to witness a mythological praxis that connects the action of the homo faber, no, I mean, the peasant uh, plowing, sowing, and harvesting to a divinity's benevolence. So since ancient times, there is an evident close link between the necessity to exercise leadership and to transform a piece of land into a prophet and a prayer to God. So God can help and make this activity possible. A prior and essential implication becomes to permanently occupy a specific portion of space. So I miss Ezer and his discourse on colonialism. We are, I repeat, in 1950, the year of the Korean War, when US President Harry Truman publicly stated that the use of nuclear weapons was under active consideration against Chinese targets during the conflict. And the original document is still available on the US Department of State official webpage. So after this preamble, which I hope was uh, useful to clarify since the beginning, and, and common and maybe um, troublesome point of view. Let's go straight now to a short analysis concerning the meaning and the origin of two terms, no? two key concepts, which will be central during the whole exposition, mythological machine and genocide. The first one, of the mythological machine is an expression often utilized by Furio Iesi, who was an Italian independent historian, archaeologist, and philosopher who prematurely died at age 39 in 1980. As Iesi rightly emphasized in his works, when we approach the past as an object of study, the past itself shows some specific characteristics. First of all, if uh, the knowledge of the past is the only way we have in order to understand and explain the present, what kind of past we are talking about? If we have abandoned some constitutive elements of our collective history, which type of memory are we invoking when we have convert the biggest genocide in human history into a glorious, heroic, and institutionalized national day? And if the main prerogative of a national party is to rebuild 
a collective spirit and try, how to say, to put in the center, no? even the latent borders of its past. Is the difference between mythology and history still visible? Or have we already completely lost the political meanings of those disciplines, reducing them to do indistinguishable entities? Um, in the ancient Greek world, where we can still perceive the smell of the seeds of our European culture, the interweaving relation between myth and reality found its own place into the mneme. That is to say, the activity of memory whose function is to retrieve past events and models which have to guide human behavior. Nevertheless, the mythological past has a specific characteristic. Although it is the source of everything we know, we can know nothing about it. That's why, on the other hand, Greek philosophy drew upon the mythical legacy, at least until Aristotle. I'm thinking, for instance, about Plato's complex use of myths, for example, the myths of the cave, or when in the Phaedrus dialogue, his master Socrates exposed a philosophical break about his faith in myths. And I remember a famous passage of Aristotle's metaphysics, just in the beginning, in the Alpha book, where the stagiate sociologically equalized mythology and philosophy. You know? And Aristotle, Aristotle wrote, he who wonders and is perplexed feels that is ignorant. Thus, the myth lover is, in a sense, a philosopher, since myths are composed of wonders. However, uh, Nosiological models enter into crisis when it's no more useful to its goals. That's why, on the other hand, Thucydides, the most important historian of ancient times, needed to dissociate himself from Herodotus, who mostly drew upon the mythical heritage. Thucydides was a decisive intellectual for two main reasons. Although he was of Athenian origin, in his history of Peloponnesian War, he emphasized and wonderfully explained that the war was caused by the aggressive Athenian politics of unlimited expansion. No? And uh, this is also <clears throat> Sorry, a demonstration of his intellectual honesty that could make blush hundreds of modern and contemporary historians and terrorists. Moreover, he made a clear distinction between mythology and history. Uh, in fact, he considered history as a discipline that must be based on the objective and direct examination of authentic documentation and witness evidence. Uh, during uh, our cultural development, this distinction between mythology and history has been gradually and, how to say, inexorably blurred under the pressure of obvious political interests and propaganda. Before uh, tackling the notion of the mythological machine operating during the modern age, let me add something about the term genocide. Since I work a lot with etymologists and try to follow the evolution and employment of some critical words, oh, Stranger, barbarous, 
uh, race, and so on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, maybe, my approach might come across as not directly relevant to the subject matter. Uh, in any case, I consider this method absolutely necessary because it gives the possibility to inquire anew into the meanings of words and concepts that have become rigid, tough structures within our collective consciousness and unconsciousness. If we want to liberate ourselves from a mendacious tradition, which is the reflection of the dark sides of the European history, a tradition that continues to glorify and celebrate the bloody colonization process by candidly calling it a civilization process, which is actually not so different for, from the Western of the ideology of exporting democracy. So if we really want to break free from this oppressive tradition, we should dig into these terms and lay bare the conflicts, misunderstandings and contradiction characterizing their etymological evolution. And this is the case of the term genocide huh? uh, that has an antique origin. At its roots, there is the ancient substantive genos huh? that stands for race, progeny, lineage, and which is derived be or even to become. However, philosophically, this verb indicates above all an ontological state of passage in the sense of becoming something different from what one used to be before the transition started. And we can also locate its presence into several modern terms such as genitive, no? grammatically, a case that effectively expresses a necessary belonging, no? biological, cultural, geographical, a belonging that transcends any distance or change. In addition, genitals, gender, genealogy, genesis, homogeneous and degenerated. No? A term, a crucial term, which will become uh, crucial for the construction of the alterity system during the modern age. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time here today to discuss more in depth the complex history of Genos and its political applications. However, for me, it's important at least to point out that it was widely used by others like Hesiod and Plato, Aeschylus and Aristotle, Sophocles and Euripides, among others. But when exactly did they employ it? Every time, they wanted to establish an unbridgeable barrier between human beings who were considered different, be careful, by nature. Uh, in ancient Greek is the locution kata fusing, uh, by nature. So that is humans who possessed different natural qualities physical, mental, intellectual, and ethical. For instance, no, Athenians and Spartans, Greeks and barbarians, men and women, master and slaves, and so on. Hmm? 
is the application of the term of the concept and the political consequences of genos. So very roughly, these are the cultural weapons that Europeans inherited and simultaneously deployed overseas as they expanded, as they <coughs> expanded from the Greek Roman wars and the Christian Middle Age. To be crystal clear, I'm not arguing that theorizations about racism and colonialism with their political effects have been identical all along history. On the contrary, there were changes, jumps, contradiction, and distortions that is always important diversify. For instance, not the use and meanings of the above mentioned word barbarous is different in Plato and Aristotle. It's different in St. Paul, Augustine of Hippo, or Ambrose of Milan. As well different is the Jewish progressive demonization inside the Christian theological and political elaboration. Nevertheless, there is a hidden and enormous content that I think we should bring to light carefully and bravery too. Um, that said, let's go straight to the year zero of modernity, 1492, in order to see the applied effects of the mythological machine. Since the time Europeans disembarked on the so-called new world, not just from a Eurocentric point of view, a generalized intellectual procedure was spread. Human beings began to be classified into specific categories according to body structure and intellectual, moral, and spiritual qualities. Psychological and ethical features were established with extreme precision. As a result, Africans were supposed to be black, phlegmatic, and weak. Americans, red, irascible, and erect, which made a, a greater uh, threat. And Asians, yellow, melancholic, and severe. As time went by, this classification became more and more refined. The ancient distinction between sacred nations and pagan nations, between Christians and the others, and let's think, for instance, about the crusading movement, was replaced by other features based on race, color, origin. No, that is exactly the Genus question we briefly saw before. Fixed characteristics and allegedly psychological configurations. The European Christian white man was therefore the only one to be considered pure intelligent, wise, no, and so on. He had a sacred mission, a mission that matched in grandeur the universalistic aspirations of the Roman Empire, the mission to civilize the entire world. This approach led to absolute certainty that colored people were intellectually inferior. They were, in fact, considered historically and mentally retarded and in need of being educated by the colonizing societies. This approach, besides killing and submerging different kinds of knowledge, resulted, as we unfortunately know, in political extermination, in genocide. The encounter between the Western Christian white man and the Black African or the Latin American natives was guided by a concept of man and humanity on the basis of which peoples and territories were judged, evaluated and classified according to a hierarchical structure. 
The specific power of Christian theology imposed universal models to follow, retreat by secularized philosophy and science. The self-referring assignment to judge relegated no Western disciplines to mere objects that could easily be modified, deleted, and remodeled in the image and likeness of white men, huh? a god among the other human beings. The epistemological revolution of the 17th and 17th centuries would maintain the same orientation as set by this initial step grounded in ontological and epistemic racism. Not only were the colonized people deprived of their knowledge built through centuries, but they were also reduced to an image. No, I repeat, a mere representation of what Europeans believed to perceive. Starting from the 16th century, the so-called third world acquired the form of a study object. The connection between power and knowledge, between military conquest and culture imposed violence is responsible of, for creating you know, the Indian, the Black, the Oriental, and so on, no? this kind of identities, new identities. There is a clear and detailed mental approach that affects the Western man. He dominates over anyone who must be dominated. This is what we can call the pedagogical and civilizing mission of the Western macro subject. No? What, for instance, Rudyard Kipling defined in a famous poem as the white man burden. The non-Western man is automatically considered inferior. And so he must be fixed and improved in his way of living and thinking. The notion of, the notion of culture was also applied to label all the rest as inferior. In fact, while the European civilization was divided into national cultures, the population of the rest of the world were considered not cultured, which meant that they were unable to operate in a universe governed by a voracious God. The result of this approach wasn't an attempt to better get to know the others, and neither to enable the uniqueness and essential traits to freely come to form. What emerged was and continues to be an ego logocentric representation. In other words, the total ignorance of them. Still today, a lot of people all around the world are convinced that Western thinkers have some kind of magical power that allows them to grasp the essence of reality behind its multiple manifestations. There is a, a kind of sort of short circuit of Western prophets, even for several Eurocentric Marxists. They try to explain, for instance, the colonial secular Russian structure with Hegel and Marx. And I'm just questioning, did they, for instance, read what Hegel wrote about Africans and Native Americans? And uh, as a matter of fact, what they seem to ignore is precisely the tight bond that historically connects class and race. Mm -hmm. Thinking, for instance, in Jose Carlos Mariategui, in Franz Fanon, in Angela Davis, for instance. So the Indians, the Orientals, the Blacks um, are seen as mistakes that must be fixed and brought back into the so called universal history the process that goes from classic Greece to modernity. 
a process capable of swallowing everything it encounters, trying to make it disappear. This idea of totality conceived in Europe led to a theoretical reductionism that brought the creation of a metaphysic based on a historical macro subject who was the author and the only protagonist of the supposed universal history. So a mythological structure, huh? a link between effective power and culture. This approach, besides killing and submerging different kinds of knowledge, resulted in political extermination driven by the puerile dream of a total rationalization of society. The characterization of the world populations based on the race concept is a mental and collective construct, a subjective representation of the self-constituted Eurocentric all one, which clearly expresses the role of colonial domination. In fact, since the beginning of colonialism, not only has the West taken over the rest of the world by brute force, but also started a sort of management process of the world according to the logic of its specific Eurocentric rationality. With the conquest, the codification of the differences between conquerors and conquered was based on biological and ethical structures that placed the colonized people on a naturally inferior level. On the other hand, and it's important not forget this, this process was the mental structure operating uh, within the new forms of war control with its human resources and products that depended on the rising capitalism and the global market. The formation of social relationships based upon this concept produced, first of all, in America, historically new social identities, no? the Indians, the Blacks, and Mestizos. In the meantime, other identities were redefined, huh? such as Spanish, Portuguese, and later European. The special position of an individual, once again, the genus problem, acquired a value and became a crucial element of identification in social, political, cultural, and psychological contexts. So the social relationships, or even better power relations, automatically placed these identities within a hierarchical configuration. Race and identity acquired the function of social, social economic stabilizers and became instruments for the classification of single population, including their languages, their knowledge, and their approaches to life. And we should never forget, I'm going to, to the end, that all this cultural structure made by colonial racism was justified, fueled, and corroborated by the most brilliant minds that modern Europe has expressed. Montesquieu, Hume, Voltaire, Kant, Hegel, Heidegger, huh? among others. They undoubtedly contribute a lot in making the mythological machine operative. Their works are available, read, studied, and commented upon. Their work are always in front of us. So why are we still deliberately ignoring the colonial perspective that inhabits this intellectual production. If we look to many European countries today, we can see that 
xenophobic, no, xenos, another term that not casually comes from ancient Greek, eh? the stranger, eh? the different ones. So xenophobic and eventually racist parties often supported by the institutions continue to gain votes. In the West and even more in the United States, Muslims are seen as a potential terrorist, as a concrete and real threat. Continuous migratory waves, especially caused for the Western war, eh, as Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, reinforce ancient stereotypes concerning the other, with the consequence that populists tend to fervently support belonging growth policies rather than external growth policies. That's why, that's why it's still possible to celebrate a genocide as a national holiday, because the mythological machine is still working. So Spanish people, for instance, can consider themselves as the heirs of a tragic past that has been erroneously and unfruitfully represented as glorious, benevolent, and even philanthropic. In my opinion, a collective disease, a dangerous lie. In conclusion, with some hope no, at the meantime, I believe in the possibility of establishing new social, cultural, and political relationships, which could permit to overcome the monotonous hypostatizations that make us feel as we were in chains. It is indeed a very difficult process that implicates an act of unlearning all the essential features of the humanistic culture in which we have been educated. It's also a question of epistemic delocalization, you know, a question of changing perspective, a question of being ready, as Nietzsche affirmed, to be good humored and serene among nothing but harsh truth. The problem here goes through two complementary stages. On the one hand, we have to discredit and bring to light all the essential feature of our epistemology, which have brought us to the construction of a phenomenological and ontological racism. On the other hand, we have to be ready to understand alterity in the way it manifests itself and not more through the mental categories we have built because they are completely useless in the process of comprehension. That is to say, we should begin now here more as intellectuals, as responsible researchers and professors to read and study not European authors in order to discover the authentic history also by remembering eh, the to see this lesson of our continent. That's why I opened the conference provocatively by staging a contrast between a Jewish European woman and a black Caribbean man. Because the perseverance in wanting to evade these problems, uh, given its intellectual, but most of all human importance, represents, in my vision, a kind of unthink attempt to hide behind ontological and epistemic barriers. And so this is not philosophy, hmm? but a militant egocentrism that while it erases the alterities, it also kills itself. 
So the term philosophy, no? love of wisdom, turns into monosophy, no? love of the one and the only. Even more so, in my opinion, as the new challenges of the present polymorphic era will oblige us to rethink and reconsider the short sated inherited Western mythologies. Well, my speech is over. Many thanks to all of you for the kind attention. So I give the, the floor to Professor Gabriel Sherbrooke. Please, Gabriel. Yes, I, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leonardo, for this. Um, uh, very interesting, interesting, of course. Uh, I am, um, I am also very, you mentioned uh, at some point um, your passion for etymology and I, I complete, I'm also uh, very keen on, uh, on, um, on, on what etymologists might uh, and can reveal, of course. Um, I am going to, uh, I have, of course, some, some questions, but I will, uh, I, I just wanted to let know everyone, if, if you want, you can also uh, like write comments or questions in the, in the chat or uh, just raise your hand uh, if, you, uh, if you have, yeah, what uh, curiosities or uh, comments or questions, of course. Um, I, I'm not sure if I will, if, if anyone wants to intervene now, uh, we can, uh, I can just give you a, a, a few seconds. Okay, I, okay, I can, um, I can, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, um, what I wanted, what I was curious about, I, um, I would like to um, just uh, shift maybe the focus a bit on the present, in the sense that, of course, you, you, uh, your your uh, uh, paper was was focused uh, on on this on the, um, on a historical background. Um, um, I, I'm I'm also interested, um, and I would like to know more about uh, maybe about uh, the recent, let's call it like. Um, uh, indignation towards um, uh, towards um, uh, the um, towards the symbols of colonialism that are expressed through um, uh, holidays, holiday celebrations, through statu uh, 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 statues, um, and uh, I'm. I'm um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm referring mainly at the, like, uh, the, uh, the recent vandalizing of statues all over the world. I'm, I was curious if you, if you, if you can give us uh, some more details about these kind of protests and maybe the differences between different countries. Also, also because you, are, uh, you live in, uh, in Barcelona, I'm also curious about, because as I think everyone knows <laughs> here that one of the sim symbolic um, one of the symbolic, um, uh, um, one of the symbols of Barcelona is the, the Columbus uh, statues on La Rambla there. And um, it's, I think it was, uh, it's also interesting, interesting uh, because there was, there was a debate, if I remember correctly, about, uh, about what to do with, uh, <laughs> with, um, uh, with, with a statue. Um, and um, even Ada Colau, <laughs> Uh, the mayor, uh, the progressive left-wing uh, mayor of, of, of Barcelona, uh, it was, it might seem quite surprising that she was, um, uh, I think she said at some point that she, she, she wanted, uh, what, what needs to be done is to recontextualize uh, the, um, uh, the, the background, let's say, of, of, of the Colombo statue and not, of course, not to remove it. Now, maybe, uh, uh, I mean, it's not, I'm not saying that, I, I, I really don't know uh, how to position myself here. Uh, um, also because I, I uh, yeah, I, I, I lack um, knowledge uh, about the, the whole, uh, 
uh, about the Spanish, uh, the, the Spanish political situation. Uh, uh, maybe you you have some uh, something to say uh, about this also, since uh, you're obviously uh, based in Barcelona. So yeah, that's 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 it for now, for me. Thank you for the interesting question. Yeah, was this a, a sort of wave oh, about this Columbia status, but. Um, since the 1972, if I remember well, was in Peru, the first one was destroyed and became more famous through the, the death of George Floyd you know, two years ago. That's why, for instance, in, in US, this kind of protest began. And uh, worldwide, even eventually in Central and South America. No, it's, of course, Columbus uh, is a symbol, as you rightly underlined, but symbol of what, no? I mean, for us, for European, is a symbol of glorious, of civilization, and so on. That's why I ended my presentation, my conference today, uh, underlining the necessity you know, to recontextualizing ourselves, first of all, no? to change our perspective. But because for me, it's a way, for instance, to understand why native people or um, Afro-American descendants are so, how to say, frustrating no? in front of this symbolic, uh, structure. Okay, so let's think that uh, Columbus, but even was the subject Columbus, uh, is an historical process that eventually overcome the subjectivity. Uh? But Columbus was a figure, is today, still today a figure, was uh, that this. this um, worthiness of a statue and uh, uh, has been repeatedly questioned uh, and even before this protest. So if we understand and if we are able to understand the others, uh, centering ourselves from a different perspective, I think that we can understand, we could understand uh, this matter. Uh, it's a kind of symbolic violence uh, that opposed to the false mythological narration of the white Christian European uh, tradition. That's why Columbus, you know, it's, I mean, maybe it's such a, a symbol. Uh, another question may be related, another issue, is uh, Columbus, it was a symbol of racism, mm -hmm. was a slave merchant and so on. And even more is uh, coming to the actuality is a great discussion debate about the so-called canceling culture, for instance. Mm -hmm. I'm not agree for the cancellation of our past. On the contrary, my opinion is what I tried to express today, what I tried to explain today, is to study in depth our past, to discover, to uncover the, this hidden past. Because the, the consequences of not knowing the real past, that is the only interpretation key in order to understand, to live, and to manage our present, consequences will be even worse. I mean, uh, it's necessary to, to bring to light this past. As European, my, my goal is not to explain to the racialized people what resonance is on how it works. Hmm? 
But my goal, my objective is to uncover our tradition no? in order to create ideologically, metaphorically, a new horizon. No? Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we we have a question. Uh, uh, I should read the question. Or, or you? Uh, there's a question on in the chat. And uh, Valeria, maybe afterwards you want to intervene. Okay. Okay. So um, Julia Young. Um, hope I pronounce it. Uh, Correctly. Oh, hi. Um, so I, I will read the question. If we indeed want to make a better world we live in, as your presentation suggests, uh, uh, is the intention and possible outcome? What would be the European tools? Okay. You mentioned humanism. Do you think humanism, which finds its roots in Christianity, not a problem in itself? Uh, thank you so much for your inspiring, I might even say, uplifting talk, Leonardo. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, but this is one million dollar question. I mean, <laughs> which could be the tools no, of, of European. I tried to, to, to explain no, another way, I mean, as, a, as an intellectual, huh, as, a, as a professor, I mean, to reread, rethink, rediscover our past. And maybe even inside the silenced and not hegemonic uh, Western past, there were silenced boys, for instance, that tried to escape from this point of view, for instance. But for me, the, the how to say, the, the most important question, the most important way is to open, hmm? open Western world to the alterity in a different way. Hmm? We have to hear the alterity. We have to collaborate with the alterity. And if we think that Western people occupies a kind of, you know, the, the top step of a stair, hmm? metaphorically, uh, we have to, <laughs> to escape, I repeat, from this position, from this kind of knowledge, from this kind of hegemonic culture that is a reflect of power, uh, of real force, brutal force, and even more because we have new challenges uh, that we are living we are experimenting so i mean i i hope that european world could be able could be could have the force and the brave for one hand i repeat to rethink and reread hmm, this past in order to understand a new way in order to manage to prepare for the future generation a new way in order to interact huh, worldwide. Okay. Um, thank you, Leonardo. Thank, uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to? Um, uh, Christian uh, has a question, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you also for uh, to Professor uh, Leonardo Franceschini for uh, his uh, um, uh, excellent uh, uh, explanation about uh, the, uh, this, his uh, research. Uh, I would like to, to ask him um, if uh, you may suggest as maybe a few authors or also a single monograph that uh, somehow already started uh, this uh, new trend in uh, uh, understanding uh, the European past in order to, to create uh, 
uh, a different uh, perspective in the future at the at a global level. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Christian. It's a, another very good question because I think, in my opinion, that one of our problem in Europe, you know, as, a, as a researcher, as student, is that we have not material. Hmm? We don't study this material. No, I, I mean, I study in Europe philosophy and in Italy, in Spain, in French. No one faculties organize courses about not European or not Western philosophy, for instance. No? So a, a lack of material, the, the first step. So um, the second one is even to me, I, I can suggest, I mean, uh, in, my, in my background, you know, how to say, was important others that I can suggest, like eventually Aimé Césaire and his uh, most brilliant disciple, Franz Fanon. It was, uh, you know, the, the wretched of the heart, for instance. Uh, from Latin America, for instance, another very interesting field of study, the so-called peripheral Marxist. Uh, that began with Jose Carlos Mariategui, who was the first indigenous Marxist from Peru, who knows, for instance, Antonio Gramsci, who was to the bring the, what I mean, uh, was to brought the, the Marxist theory produced in Europe for the first time to South America. And today, I don't know, Enrique Dussel, for instance, the father of philosophy of liberation, one of the most important thinkers of the last 60 years, almost completely unknown, I repeat, in Europe, Enrique Dussel. Or, I don't know, an anthropologist like Colombian anthropology that his work I appreciate so much is Eduardo Restrepo. Anthropology. Uh, and eventually also the decolonial feminism, for instance. I mentioned just Angela Davis, no matter what, a lot of black feminism, um, South American or native you know, feminism, and even uh, there is a uh, Islamic uh, feminism. And that's why it's, a, it's such a multiplication of this, uh, this matter that's so interesting. I mean, uh, maybe link at even the, the, the last question of Julie to, to, to your question is the necessity of begin seriously to study this material. We don't have, no, we, even for political reasons, no, economical reasons, because this author show us, I don't know, I don't like to say the real authentic history of Europe, uh, as was at 100%. But for sure, they offer to us, they show us a different perspective of who has suffered you know, the modernity, the colonization process. That's why for me, it's, it's so important, I repeat, to delocalizing de ourselves, you know, to say, okay, let's go and just let to hear, to listen. Mm -hmm. That's something that we are not used to do mm -hmm. because we have this cultural narrative to uh, speak over the others, for the others and over the others. You know? So to, to take you know, a, a seat metaphorically and be ready to listen carefully. It's a Pacific way, no, I say it's a... For me, it's like for, for my background, this was essential, crucial in my, my background, in my studies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and for the, for the answer, of course. Um, is there anyone else? We still maybe have time for uh, another question. Yes. Uh, Please. Yeah, I'm, I'm Miklos, yeah. Um, thank you for, um, uh, Leonardo, for this uh, fascinating presentation. Um, so my question is that, um, is that what do you think about, um, so you, you, you nicely 
delineated this genealogy of, of colonial racism that basically um, uh, even makes its presence felt today. But um, I think for historical accuracy, it is, it is worth emphasizing that, that uh, the modern idea of race didn't exist in, in, uh, in ancient times in Athens, for example. So it's it's uh, it's quite um, often it is emphasized that uh, there is they had colonialism they had slavery, but sorting people based on their phenotypes didn't exist in ancient Athens. So basically, color of the skin was not a basis for for being a slave, and that as you discussed in ample details about the the Iberian. Uh, period of the 15th century. Actually, that is the time where this this uh, kind of, uh, of sorting people into into uh, categories based on their color of skin started. And and some historians even point out that basically the uh, the inspiration for that was um, was uh, Arabic slave merchants um, during that time. So. Um, um, I think that's an important uh, um, addition to uh, um, um, perhaps to not to, or a bit more more um, 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 to not to, so 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 not to make um, uh, the the. Uh, the co to, to be more cautious with the connection between between. Uh, uh, um, um, the the ancient ethnic uh, 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 history and and between between uh, more modern colonialism, so that that would be my point. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mizala. I, I hope to. Uh, have yeah, uh, sorry, Miklos. Yeah, it's like uh, oh, okay. Okay. Miklos Zala. That's the <laughs> the short <laughs> version of my name. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, clearly, I, I had less time today. You know, it was a brief presentation. I have not the opportunity to go deeply, you know, inside the question. And totally agree with your position. You know, and I tried even in a, in a passage to say that it's not uh, as such of metaphysics structure. No, since from the ancient Greek to the modern, because there are jumps, contradiction, changes, and so on. Uh, what about the biological tough in ancient Greek? In my opinion, is a work that we have still hmm, to make. I'm not so sure, but even you know, because I, I, I work, I wrote a PhD dissertation about this no but it's, it's, it's complicated it's very complicated and I uh, medically underlined you know, what what you said and totally agree and the meantime the it's very interesting to to praise the the um, stereotypes on the meanings of the colors for instance now why I put a, a sample eh? why Jewish people will wear, a yellow triangle into the Nazi extermination camps. Because since the Middle Age, the yellow, the Christian Middle Age, the yellow was a color that meant to be impure, to be treasured, and so on. So that's why. And for instance, Jewish people, uh, even in Italy, and I, I'm talking about between if I remember well, the mid of the of the, the end of the 13th century, for one century more, more or less, was a bike to wear some yellow distinction, for example, a triangle or a, a cap or something even jewelry hmm? to be recognized. Why? Because Christians couldn't have sexual relationship with Jews. Why? Once more because the problem of bloody purity, the race comes from the genos, no? I mean, the genos, the genealogy and to give birth, no? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated, it's even more because it's a, still today uh, and hidden, no, it's covert past because it's, it's complex and 
uh, this this past uh, um, could mean to reinterpret it completely, you know, our common history. Huh? Yeah, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miklos, for your uh, question, and Leonardo, of course. Um, does anyone have any other question? Uh, maybe we have one. Okay. Um, okay. I uh, we can. Uh, I I just wanted to very a very brief uh, comment just to um, to relate to uh, a bit. To, it's not a, a really a question. It's just a, a um, unfortunately, an impression that I that I have. I say unfortunately because it's a bit pessimistic. I I, I didn't really want to to close on uh, on a pessimistic tone, but I uh, I think that uh, yeah, uh, Julie also um, uh, mentioned this, and I and I think. Uh, uh it's 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 it is a, a big problem that may be inescapable problem that uh, is how how to um yeah how uh it, it there is obvious obviously a a, a connection um between um this kind of humanism european humanism that somehow pretends and tries to uh, of course, to uh, overcome uh, the the violence and uh, injustices of the past, uh, but at the same time, of course, it is somehow rooted. I mean, we owe our uh, our critical tools and um, our uh, ideas of emancipation. Uh, we owe it at the same time to the very uh, tradition. Uh, European tradition and dominant tradition that also produced uh, violence, uh, racism, domination, exclusion, of course, and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that was just my. Uh, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in actually in this point, uh, and uh, I also thank uh, thank Julie for um, for bringing it up. Uh, yeah. I don't know if. Anyone wants to add anything uh, else? Uh, if not, I can, uh, we can, uh, yeah, it's almost uh, half one. Uh, okay. Leonardo? No, 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 okay, okay. okay. Yeah. No, I'm just, uh, just hearing you. Okay, uh, well, if, uh, if, if, uh, uh, there's no other questions or comments i can uh, we can uh, close here thank you again to the for, to the center and uh, to leonardo of course uh, for uh, for being here with us today and uh, and thank you thank you you thank you for the questions because it was uh, i think it was uh, well we 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 didn't solve the the, the world problems obviously but <laughs> i think we we had we had some interesting uh, uh, interesting insights. Okay, uh, I'm. Uh, I, I will close here. Thank you all, uh, okay. and uh, have a great day. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriel, and for the center for all the people that put attention in this seminar. I was so so glad to to share with all of you and. Even thank you very much for these interesting questions. It let me stimulate you know, to, to, to go forward in my studies. Thank you very much once again. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.